All right, good evening, everyone. This is going to be a video about uh, this year's Pork Fest. It's been a couple years since I got to go, uh, but I've uploaded videos on it in the past, and I just found out today that I'll be able to attend. The last few years, uh, I've been unable to go to Pork Fest because of work. Uh, typically, I would be, it's, it's actually been really bad. The, the last two years, um, I had dates basically with my work. They, they, when an oil well starts, it's called the spud date, the day that they intend to begin drilling. And so the spud dates would be right on, right when Porkfest was starting. And, uh, I would go out there and on the way there, they would get delayed like 10 days. So <clears throat> the last two years I could have gone to Porkfest but was instead uh, in Wyoming waiting for a delayed oil rig, which, you know, was easy money, which was good, and I have plenty to do in Wyoming, so it wasn't all that bad. Um, but I had to miss Porkfest, which was definitely a downside. Uh, so this year I just got a message today from work that I will be going back out to Wyoming as planned, but a month later than I originally thought. So that will definitely allow me to go to Porkfest. So I made the decision basically within seconds of getting that text from work that uh, I would be attending Porkfest. So I've just gone ahead and made the arrangements with uh, where I'm going to stay, getting my tickets. And uh, I think Porkfest is a great event. It's a lot of fun. And <clears throat> I really encourage people to, to come. I, I think the first year that I came was in 2012. And I had a great time. I made a lot of new friends. Uh, I bought a whole bunch of Bitcoin that ended up being very helpful to me in the long run. Um, and I kept coming to Porkfest. And so eventually, I think I came twice. And then I actually moved to New Hampshire very, very much as a result of having gone to Porkfest. Uh, and uh, it's just, it's a really unique, cool event. So for those of you who don't know, Porkfest is short for the Porcupine Freedom Festival. Uh, it's probably the main event put on by the Free State Project every year. They have a couple other events uh, in the in the Winter Freedom Fest and Freedom Forum. Uh, those are more like uh, conferences, usually in a hotel in either Manchester or Nashua. <coughs> Pork Fest is like a party seminar get together, recruiting smorgasbord of all kinds of uh, various different things. So. Um, it's in Lancaster, uh, New Hampshire, which is on the Connecticut River on the border with Vermont in the northern third uh, of New Hampshire. It's right at the northern, just it's just north of the White Mountains uh, in a place called Rogers Campground. I think originally they had it in different places, but it's been in Rogers Campground now for like 10 years. Um, and uh, it's in this very picturesque location uh, where the presidential range, where Mount Washington and Mount Jefferson and uh, Mount Adams are all located. Um, you can see it very clearly to the eastern horizon. So you get these epic views just about every day. There's great hiking around there. And the event, I mean, there's there's the official events. There's a whole bunch of lectures that are going to be given. And I was looking at the list. There's a lot of people that I wanted to see this year. So let me go over the list here. Do, do, do. Yeah, so David Friedman's going to be there. David Friedman has gone, I think, every year that I've gone and maybe many other years. Um, at this point, I just think he enjoys going. I'm sure they're inviting him and giving him a free pass or whatever, and he will give lectures, and he's always interesting to listen to. He's very approachable, and you can have conversations with him. I've relayed this story many, many times, and I'll relay it again for those of you who haven't heard it. Uh, if, like, if you you know you're at Porkfest because you, I saw a gay Arab anarchist with an AK-47 slung over his shoulder having a conversation with David Friedman about... I think it was polycentric legal orders, but I could be wrong. So he's going to be there. Um, and, you know, this is a good chance to hear his lectures and get to talk to him. But then he's very approachable. He'll be there for days and days and days walking around. And the exposure is so, it's still, you know, if you go to a conference, you know, there's not that much time. With here, you're talking about several days, perhaps in some cases up to a week nearly. And so there's plenty of time to, to get to see these people, you know, talk around the campfire, talk around dinner. It's just a really great experience. Um, so the other big one on the list that I'm also excited to see is Dave Smith. So Dave Smith is an anarcho-capitalist uh, comedian. He's got a show called Part of the Problem. Uh, I don't know how popular it is, but I, th I think it's fairly popular. He's been on Joe Rogan a couple times. 
very smart, uh, very funny libertarian. This is the one podcast that I actually listen to, listen to. There's a lot of podcasts that I listen to certain episodes, but part of the problem, I listen to like every single episode. Okay, so I'm just looking here. They're going to have Maj Torre from the founder. He's the founder of Black Guns Matter. So that's, I mean, that's woke anarcho-capitalism right there. That's going to be awesome. Uh, I've listened to a couple of interviews with him, and he seems to have his head very much in the right place. He, you know, that The whole point there is just recognizing the political significance of firearm ownership. Um, especially for groups if you're going to say that they're marginalized or oppressed or whatever. So uh, I think this will be his first time going there, and I think that's going to be awesome. And it's just cool what kind of event you're going to have him and then David Friedman. Uh, we got Jeffrey Tucker. He's another one who's gone many, many times in the past, uh, at least two or three. Again, very approachable. Uh, I don't know what he'll be talking about, um, but you know, you can talk to him. It doesn't matter what his scheduled event is. <clears throat> All you got to do is talk to him. A lot of these guys let loose quite a bit too. Uh, we're gonna have Lynn Albrecht, Ross Albrecht's mother. She's gone in the past. They usually do a lot of fundraising for him. I learned a lot about the Ross Albrecht case at Porkfest from her. Uh, so that'll be kind of sad, but uh, you know it's good to see her. And then we're gonna have Jacob Hornberger. Wow. <clears throat> so he's <clears throat> Jacob Hornberger is, <clears throat> I think, the founder and president of the Future Freedom Foundation. Uh, I think I was listening to him uh, 15 years ago. So he's more of a conservative libertarian, but a pretty conservative, like John Birch Society type-esque person. So quite radical compared to what we have today, but not necessarily anarcho-capitalist, but that should be good. <clears throat> Big one for me, Scott Horton. Uh, so I probably became a an anarcho-capitalist by listening to Scott Horton way back in 2003. Uh, he did some interviews with Joe Sobrin and Hans Hermann Hoppe in particular that uh, really struck home with me. He's kind of, he's got a couple topics that he's really knowledgeable about. Uh, Waco, the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, and then then he since in the last, I don't know, 10 years have been almost completely focused on foreign policy. The Iraq war, the war in Afghanistan, the various wars in Yemen and Somalia and Syria. And he has done, I think I think this week will mark the 5,000th interview he's done. And when I say interview, it's not, a, these are interviews with <clears throat> mainstream people, Seymour Horsch, reporters, experts, like, I mean, it's, I guess anyone who has a show who's doing interviews can interview all kinds of people, but he's, he's really getting the most knowledgeable people and has been for so long. Um, he doesn't really do the theoretical libertarian stuff that much anymore, which he did a little bit earlier, which is when I listened to him. But uh, his book on Afghanistan is a must-read, I think, for anyone who wants to understand our role in that war there. Um, encyclopedia, encyclopedic knowledge of a foreign policy and events. I'm almost always impressed by uh, his erudition on the topic. Uh, and uh, yeah, so he's going to be there, and I'm actually really excited to get a chance to meet him. I've been a fan of his for a very, very long time. So uh, I was kind of bummed. You know, I heard, I heard that uh, Smith and Horton were going to be there uh, before and I, I I was kind of like oh damn I'm gonna miss and you know since I only work a few months out of the year I can't really afford to just not do it so I was like whatever I'll you know I guess I'll I'll live without you know it's just a luxury after all and so I was quite happy to learn that I, I'll be able to go this year so yes uh, Pinto I am gonna go this year so um, I had seen posted uh, for those who want to know uh, Porkfest is a campground, so there's uh, camping trailer sites and there's tent sites. Uh, my guess is that they are all full by now, but it's not. Po it might be possible that you can look. Let me look on the dates here. Uh, ba -ba -ba. So let's see, Porkfest this year is from June 18th to the 23rd at Rogers Campground in Lancaster, New Hampshire. Um, I think that all the spots there are going to be full. Um, however, and so I would, um, you know, if you, you can, I could be wrong and it also depends. They're more busy later in the week, like set Friday and Saturday. That's kind of prime time. So sometimes it's possible to get spots earlier in the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, instead of uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, but you can always call Rogers campground and find out. My guess is that they're full. Uh, so the first year that I went, um, I, it was, again, a kind of spur of the moment. I, I realized literally a week before that I was going to have the opportunity to go. And so I went spur of the moment. And uh, there was another YouTuber at the time, a Scottish libertarian by the name of Podreg, who I knew was going. And uh, I contacted him and said, hey, I'd like to go. 
because he had gone in the past and I was like, would you be willing to let me stay on your camping spot? And he said, sure, of course. So um, I brought a tent, but I ended up just sleeping in the back of my pickup truck for that week. Um, now the next year I knew in advance that I was going to go. I made a point of deciding to go and I uh, got in early enough. I think typically this, if you want to get a good spot or you want to make sure you have a spot, you kind of have to reserve the, 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 the camping sites like in January. And so like in January of the, of the next year, 2013, I reserved a spot in a tent. And then I actually had a subscriber, uh, KDOTECA, for uh, some of you may know him. Uh, well, he doesn't make videos anymore, but uh, at least to my knowledge. Uh, so KDOTECA and I uh, commuted there. Uh, he lived in Wisconsin. I lived in Michigan. He took the ferry across the lake. I picked him up in Muskegon. We drove across country. We split the bill. And then we had a tent and we split everything 50-50. Uh, and then the next year, I wasn't sure if I was going to get to go or not, but I learned enough to know that you don't have, <laughs> where's the trap? Uh, it's the Death Star shields are up. Come on. So, uh, the, f one thing you learn though, is if you can't find a site on, because Rogers is filled up, that's not the end of the world because pretty much everyone who goes there is a capitalist. And pretty much everyone who goes there, if you are, I mean, if you're willing to be friendly with people and whatever, you can probably get a spot for free. If you're willing to pay, you can definitely get a spot for, for uh, get a spot not for free for, but for pay. So the last year that, so 2014, when I went, I had nothing, nothing planned. I hadn't found a spot in, 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 in the beginning. I just went, I brought my tent, uh, and, uh, the first day I was there, I walked around, started talking to people. I struck up a conversation with somebody, kind of befriended them a little bit, and then I was like, "Hey, I'm looking for a spot. I would be willing to, uh, you know, uh, pay you for basically subleasing part of your your land." And he was like, "Sure, fine. You can stay for free." So I stayed for free that year. Um, and then the next year, I just didn't want to be in a tent. I wanted to be in a camp in a, a hotel. So I went ahead and just got a hotel, uh, like you know, six months before, uh, and. I've been, but I brought other friends, other subscribers. I've given people rides from Boston, for instance, and uh, they'll go and just find somebody who will, you know, just, hey, I got some money, can I have a spot? And they allow you to do it. So, and whether you want a hotel, whether you want uh, a camping site, you can find somebody who will, will be willing to do it for money. So, um, are the traps gay? <laughs> yeah, I've got, a, I've got a potion that I give people to turn them gay. Hope to see you there. Big fan. Thanks. Well, uh, I'm not going to know who you are, Pinto Benches, so you're just going to have to come and say I'm Pinto Benches. Um, I'm at a, it's, I'm not like libertarian famous, but it is a little weird when, you know, somebody just comes and says, hey, I think I know you. Um, so yeah, just introduce yourself. That's fine. I've met lots of subscribers at these events. Um, and that's always nice. And it's kind of like all the, not all, but many of the libertarian personalities you know out there you're going to see are all the cyber identities you know, the people that you know online from whatever, whether it be Reddit or YouTube or Facebook, um, there's a chance to meet them. There's a whole bunch. Uh... <laughs> Freedom Fest? Yeah, I don't know. Pork Fest is the thing, man. I mean, Pork Fest is so much fun. Uh, it's crazy the spectrum of stuff that happens. So, for instance, it's actually quite family friendly, and I've heard David Friedman talk about this a lot. He's been doing libertarian events for you know close to fifty years now, and he says you know when you go to a libertarian event, it's going to be it's a sausage fest basically. It's all men, and Pork Fest has a lot of families. It's got like I don't know, it's close to fifty percent women that are going to be there, and there's a lot of kids. There's a lot of kids events. And, uh, I mean, the last time I went, I, you have the surreal experience of seeing, like, God, he couldn't have been more than 14, 13, 14 year old kids with AR 15s on their backs, walking around, playing, play, playing games. Uh, you see a ton of open carry of handguns, of rifles, of swords, of knives, whatever. Uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of gun sales going on. Not that I witnessed that, but I'm sure that there were, um, and so it's kid friendly. There's a lot of gay guys who go. So there's actually leather, like there's leather orgies that happen. Um, there's a lot of drugs going on. There's free love, free sex, free drugs. But then there's also tasteful, like white collar, uh, conservative people there. It's, it's, it's a really strange environment. Um, 
any highlights that stand out for for you from the first from the last time you went? <sighs> See, I got to keep all the memories straight in my mind. So I had I made a lot of friends, uh, a lot of gay friends in particular, uh, and uh, this would be kind of like a conclave that we would all meet at. But um, you make new friends too. So I made some subscriber friends. So some of my subscribers who live live nearby, we've, we've become friends, hiking buddies. Uh, after going to Pork Fest, um, you know, just it, that's the main thing: the social connections. But you do learn things too. Uh, you know, I learned about Bitcoin at Pork Fest, and I made videos about it then. Uh, and it was so ha so far ahead of the curve on that uh, relative to ninety nine point nine nine percent of the population. Um, so the the discussions are very interesting. When you go to the lectures, they can be interesting, and some of them are quite heated and quite good. But then just the discussions that are happening on the sidelines. I remember meeting the sauce, for instance, years ago, uh, Matt Pritchard. Um, that wasn't last year. That was several years ago. That was really fun. He was a fun guy to hang out with. There's a, usually a clique of New York anarcho-capitalists who come up, and this is kind of like their chance to escape Leviathan for a little while. Um, but you uh, see them quite regularly. Uh, someone like Michael Malice I met there, again, years ago. Uh, so th I think that's the main thing. And then just around the fire, making new connections, having good conversations, staying up way too late, getting up way too early, um, seeing the Agora in action. There's all this stuff that's for sale. Uh, there's all kind of deals that can be made. Um, it's just, it's kind of a testament, you know, because there are, there's a lot of differences, right? There are redneck Muslims, for instance, there are a whole bunch of these people who converted to Islam, but they're Caucasians and they're from the South and they wear suspenders and have beards and wear camo and you have them, but then you have gay Arabs, you have, uh, gay crypto people. Um, but you've got like, I don't know, crypto Amish people. You've got a militia people like gun rights people. Uh, it's just a, it's just a really eclectic mix. Usually you get a whole bunch of like reporters go there from vice. There's a vice article. If you go and find the vice article from 2015, you can find pictures of me on there. Uh, I'm not named in them, but they went to the, there used to be uh, lamentably no longer goes on, but there's an anarcho-capitalist from New York City named Buzz, and Buzz would put a big party called Buzz's Big Gay Dance Party. Lamentably, it hasn't happened in the last couple of years, um, but it's a big gay dance party where most of the people who go are not gay, but still. Um, but a lot of these reporters come just because it's such a novelty that they will, wow, look at all these different people. And I mean, you'll never, you'll never know. You can see David Freeman. The last time I went, I met Solonousis. Solonousis is the head of the GOP in Michigan. I only knew that because I was from Michigan. And, uh, you know, so I saw him, he was just standing around the fire, you know, just standing around the fire. And I was like, Hey, I don't want to intrude, but like, are you from Michigan? Cause I'm from Michigan too. And, oh, I'm Solonousis. Or I said, are you, are you Solonousis? And yeah. And then it turned out he was, uh, he was friends with, um, the founder of the free state project. Uh, why am I not remembering his name? The guy who thought about it at Yale, Jason Sorens. So it's just crazy. The, you'll, you'll be walking like, Oh, it's so-and-so from wherever. Um, that you know from YouTube or whatnot, and you can say, "Oh, I like like your videos," or not. So let's see. Uh, Will Cooley. Who is Will Cooley? I don't know who that is. Uh, 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 drugs are good. Yeah, I mean they have vending machines that will take Bitcoin or silver, and you can buy like mushrooms, weed, silver bullets. They have fifty caliber bullets. You know, all kinds of weird things. Uh, food. All unlicensed. There's a, a vi video when I was there in 2015. Uh, I got some messages on, like, I got an email from somebody, and he's like, "Hey, are you at Porkfest? Did you see this happen? Did you hear about this?" And I didn't even know what they were talking about. Two guys from the state, from like the New Hampshire uh, state regulator's office, had come out to check the vendors' licenses. They were checking to see if one uh, people had licenses to um, sell food. And they got surrounded by all these armed people who were very antagonistic and said, you just came to the wrong place. Get the fuck out of here. And uh, they left. <laughs> like, I'm sure, you know, they just decided it wasn't worth it and they left. Uh, because this is definitely a place where there would be there would be problems. So, um, let's see. Yeah, so it's just it's just a very interesting event. Uh, there's, there's always stuff to talk about. There's always new people to meet. Uh, kind of the downside is the facilities at Rogers are not really set up for as big as the event has become. Uh, there's too many people there, especially later in the week, and uh, the uh, infrastructure is just not there. So taking a shower is difficult because there is not enough hot water, for instance. Uh, 
Yeah, the state getting a taste of its own medicine. So I got to give credit to the owner. His name is Ro Rogers Campground. Uh, he apparently took them aside and said, I think you need to leave. Um, and I don't know what kind of pressure they put on him, but uh, yeah, they, they left right away. You can find a video of it too if you go online. There's a video of them getting surrounded uh, and you know, basically retreating uh, very wisely. Um, it's just because um, you, I think, I don't know how many have gone the last couple of years, but the years that I went, they were getting about 3,000 people, and I don't know, 50% of them were armed, and probably 50% of them were like ideological, philosophical anarchists on top of that. So, um, and you meet a lot of international people. Here's the other thing people from England will come, people from Australia, people from Scandinavia, people from Israel, uh, Brazilians, all kinds of different people from all over the world will congregate. So, you get a chance to meet people like that. Uh, how many people are we talking about? I don't know about this year, and I don't know about the last two or three years. But the last year that I went in 2015, it was, I think, 3,000. But they're not exactly sure. Like, people pay, but it's not policed super well. So the numbers that they have are going to be minimal. Um, and, you know, it's like herding cats. So it's not – it's the, org the level of organization is quite minimal. Uh, Zach Wilcox just joined the Free State Project or – Porkfest is in Lancaster, New Hampshire. Rogers Campground. If you type Porkfest 2019 into Google, it'll come up. Uh, basic admission for the week is $80. I think it's $100 at the door. So if you don't, I mean, if you show up and you haven't made plans, you can still get in. Um, so that admission gets you into the campground, and then you have to figure out your own lodgings. But like I said earlier, Everyone there is a capitalist, and if you are willing to pay, your, I mean, it took me it took me an hour. I had seen a posting on Facebook a couple weeks ago from a guy, another subscriber actually, who I met at Parkfest years ago, very briefly, and he said he had he had posted in one of the um, Free State forums, "Hey, I'm going to Parkfest. Hey, I got a room. Uh, I need someone. I want. To, does anyone else want to split the room with me?" And I contacted him today, and I said, "Hey, I'm interested." And he said, "Well, I only have it for a couple days, and then someone else already got the the last, you know, during the weekend." I said, well, I'll do the, I'll do the days that he's not there, and then we just split it 50-50. And then I said, well, can I have the other days and just sleep on the floor? And he said, yeah, that's fine. And so it's going to be twenty bucks a night, so really cheap. Thanks. I didn't want to leave the video to Google it. <laughs> you can't open up a second bar. Maybe you're on your phone. Um, yeah, I mean, so if you bring a tent, if you bring a tent, and you go, I've done that several times, as I said earlier in the video, you can bring a tent, and you just got to find somebody who's willing to give you a tent. And I wouldn't recommend just, um, I mean, you could just go, hey, can I get a tent? Can I get a tent? Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of entrepreneurship that goes around. Uh, one guy was telling me that, uh, like, a, a 10-year-old boy came up to him and said, hey, if you pay me a dollar a day, I will bring you a cup of coffee at 7 a.m. or whatever. Uh, and so they had that, they had like 12 year olds going around people, taking people's trash. Um, so yeah, if you go and you say, Hey, I've got money. I, I mean, if you ask for charity, I've had spots for free. I mean, I made friends with people and they say, Hey, you can stay here for free. And sometimes you can go and say, Hey, you know, if I gave you 30 or 40 bucks a night, can I have a corner of your spot? Cause the, the campsites are usually big enough to accommodate, um, tents and there's plenty of area to park. So people's cars can be parked someplace else. And then, so, uh, Jackfest is more like camping than Parkfest. It's all woods. So Parkfest is, I mean, it's surrounded by woods. It's just a regular campground, so it's not like wilderness camping. Um, but it is actually in a fairly rural area. I mean, you're on the slopes of this of, of this hill, and you can see the White Mountains uh, off to the distance. You can actually actually see the weather station on top of Mount Washington pretty clearly. Um, and I'm, it's been a couple years, but the first year I went there, there were black bears running around. I think if you look at the dumpsters every morning, uh, you're a good chance to see black bears. And, uh, if the, if the ticks aren't too bad, there's moose. Uh, so I don't know what it is about that area. That stretch of highway has a couple, has a couple amusement parks. There's a Christmas village, a place called Santa's village, which I learned everything I know about Santa's village. I learned from the elves that I hooked up with who went, who worked there, but, um, I don't know why that's like a touristy little stretch of the highway because it's a very scenic area. Uh, you're only like probably 30, 40 miles from Franconia Notch. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, that's a really scenic 
an area where the old man and the mountain used to be. It's since crumbled. But a tremendous hiking. If you like to hike, anyone who likes to hike, uh, honest to God, the best hiking east of the, of the Rockies is within an hour of there. You can see you can see the the Presidential Range, Franconia Notch. Also, those are the two best hiking areas I think, like in the eastern United States, eastern two thirds of the United States. So, um, if you like hiking, do that. M Mount Cabot is nearby. Um, so if that's something you like, that's great. Also, there's some good kayaking around as well. Um, yeah, so good place to buy crypto, good place to buy silver. There'll be lots of books. Uh, the lectures, again, lectures could be about economic topics. They could be about political action. Uh, there are lectures on how to get into real estate. You know, there's, there's free staters who are big into real estate, who are millionaires, who own a lot of property and they want to encourage other libertarians to become capitalists and entrepreneurs and they will give lectures on how to become homeowners and business owners. There's others that will give lectures on how to be uh, uh, how to raise bees. I watched a whole lecture on how to, how, to, how to start your own beekeeping and where to get the bees and what kind of honey to use and all this. And then there would be lectures on Krav Maga and then there'd be lectures on build your own AK-47 and then there'd be uh, last year I went they had a machine gun shoot and so Ba, ba, ba. Jack Fest, there's nothing around for about 20 miles. Okay, that's more isolated than Pork Fest then. According to the U.S., it's owned by Mexico, but Mexico denies this. Interesting. No, it's not that isolated. But I think there's um, defense in numbers. Uh, ba, ba, ba. What do you do in that area while well, not at the fest personally? Like you are mentioning lectures and crypto stuff. Like what do you enjoy? You mean I'm not sure I understand the question. Like, what do you do in the area? Like I live I live in New Hampshire. Now, I live in Manchester, which is about two hours south of where Porkfest is gonna be. Um But I like so that that, that area is just I, I really love New Hampshire because of the hiking is one of the main reasons, and the hiking up there is just fantastic. Uh, some of the best scenery that you can have, um, and just really fun hikes. If you don't get hypothermia, which has happened before. Uh, doing Burning Man instead. Oh, that's so cliche. Come on. Come on, Erickson. Oh, all this stuff to do at Porkfest? Well, other than hooking up, I mean, just the conversations. Uh, they have activities. Most of them I don't do. They usually have sh a sh a gun shooting. Uh, in the past, the Apple the Appleseed Foundation has been there. I don't know if they're going to be there again this year. They're basically people who um, spread marksmanship. They want to teach people to be good marksmen. Oh, yeah. I mean, I met, fuck, years ago, I met Boston Tea Party there. That was a huge treat. So Boston Tea Party, the go-to guy if you want to learn about firearms and you don't know anything, his book Boston's Tea Par or a Boston's Gun Bible is just an amazing almanac on on gun rights and becoming a gun owner and a shooter. But he also has great books on the Constitution, Hologram of Liberty, uh, You and the Police, like great author, definitely a cool guy. I got to meet him there, I think in 2013. It's just so crazy you see him he's wearing his he's wearing his his handgun and he's playing frisbee. Status do Burning Man. Absolutely right, Jared. Why would you... Like, I don't see how you could... Porkfest is better in every way. I'm sorry. There's just no comparison. Hologram of Liberty is a great book. Uh, there, it, it, and I'll give him credit. He just quotes extensively from other sources. So the Anti-Federalists, especially the Federal Farmer. Uh, and then Lysander Spooner. That's that's where I first read about Lysander Spooner in detail. Because he, he, he quotes from... Uh, uh, the Constitution of No Authority and No Treason a lot. Um, and Molan Labe is a fun novel, although he definitely has a Pollyanna problem with his antagonist there. Uh, uh, I'll be honest, like just meeting my friends and making new friends. Uh, but I do want to see, I do want to meet like Scott Horton and Dave Smith. Scott Horton especially because 
he's just been a really important part of my philosophical development and I really appreciate all the work that he's done uh, and you know this is my chance to get to meet him so I'm really happy about that uh, just going up there it's just a beautiful area um, and we'll see what I don't know what the like so I know the speakers I don't know what they're gonna be talking about necessarily so there will be programs and you can go and look and see what are they gonna lecture on you kinda every day you can look and see what lectures do you want to go and what lectures do you not want to go to and uh, you know pick and choose any thoughts on sticks hammer 666 my roommate watches him um, it seems he seems okay it's not really my style you know he does he does shorter videos and I'm not saying I don't agree with a lot of what he says but I, I just I'd rather go into it much longer than that which is probably why he has like a a thousand times more subscribers than I do, to be honest. Yeah, I would love. Yeah, Rockbart said I met I met I met Lou Rockwell's sister there one year. Uh, she was there. I'd like to see Tom Woods. Uh, Bob Murphy has gone many times in the past. I don't I don't think he's going this time, but he might show up. Um, what did I say? How dare you? Yeah, Scott Horton and Dave Smith are amazing. I mean, I, I don't I hesitate to call Scott Horton a podcaster. Um, but he is, he's a fantastic source on all kinds of information, uh, and really principled guy, but he doesn't let it get in the way. So he interviews a lot of people who are not libertarians and he doesn't like get into a debate with them about libertarianism. He lets them tell their piece and get, gets what information or expertise they have to offer. So he said Rothbard was a cartoon and cap. Who said that? Oh, what's the best and worst cartoon and cap? Apparently there is a cartoonist going. I, I didn't know who they was, so I didn't replay his name. Um, what does it say here? Uh, Seamus Coughlin, Freedom Tunes founder, political cartoonist. I don't know. I mean, I don't know anything about him, uh, but he's listed here. And then Na Na Naomi Brockwell, a TV producer and host. And again, I don't really know her at all either. So. If you guys do know who they are and you think that they're cool, uh, one more reason to go. But I, I don't know who they are. So, see more. Oh, see more featured speakers. What what is this? Who else is going? Oh, they just have more details about them. Oh, here we go. Jason Stapleton. There we go. Uh, T Tone Vase, Wall Street veteran, Bitcoin enthusiast. I don't know him. Vermin Supreme. Okay, Vermin Supreme goes all the time. So you know that's just kind of a colorful character to expect to see there. Uh, Carla Gorecki. Okay, well, she's the drunk who's the president of the Free State Project. <laughs> oh, excuse me. President Emeritus. Yeah, she's some drunk South African. Please don't. Maybe she maybe she cleaned up her act after a while. She did lose a lot of weight, so maybe she did stop drinking. I don't know. Um, and then Vin Armani, pod host, host and activist. Uh, I don't know about his podcast. I don't know anything about him. That's cool. Vermin Supreme. So Vermin Supreme famously wants us to switch to a pony-based economy. That's his plan to solve all the Republic's woes. But yeah, he'll be there. Du, 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 du. Cartoon ancaps are people who have cartoon avatars and talk. Okay. Du, du, du. But yeah. There's great hiking. I think the nearest, uh, so in New Hampshire, the mountains are ranked by, if they're 4,000 feet or taller, they're called 4,000ers. And there's one nearby there called Mount Cabot, which is the most northern. And I've never hiked it, but I was, <laughs> was talking to, a, again, this was a straight dude at Porkfest. And he said, oh, yeah, I just hiked it this morning. And I said, how was it? He goes, oh, it's great. I hiked it naked. And I was like, wait, what? He's like, yeah, I hiked it naked. So, you know, and apparently that's not legal in New Hampshire, but nobody's going to stop you, so... Everyone gets a pony. Yep. Progressive pony tax. Do, do, do. So yeah, he'll be there. So you can uh, you can pry his brains. He'll probably be on a panel with David Friedman. Uh, I mean, in the past, I, I did a video about it, but there was a debate between David Friedman and Bob Murphy about Chicago school versus uh, Austrian school. Um, Molyneux has gone in the past, and I've I made a couple videos about Molyneux after seeing him at Porkfest. 
And that really, I mean, just to kind of show you, you see Molyneux, if you know Molyneux, you just see his podcast, you see his videos, and you just see this version of him. And then you go to Park Fest and like, you see the real him and what he's, I mean, not to say you can't tell what he's really like from his videos, but it's just a different perspective on these people. And uh, who else? I mean, Dan D'Amico used to go, uh, uh, Brian, uh, Ben Powell at Suff from Suffolk University. Um, I just oh Michael Humer's gone in the past, so be cool to see them again. Oh hey Camel, I didn't know you watched my channel. I thought I just knew you from Porkfest. I didn't know that you knew me on YouTube. In an echo stand, there will be nudists walking down the street. Yes, selling heroin to children. Who will not be in school? They'll be working in coal mines for a penny a day. Saw you on my live subs. Yeah, so I guess I'll get to see you. Yeah, that'll be cool. I haven't seen you since like God. When was that? Was that 2013, 2014? I remember we met at the fire. You were with that. You flew in from Chicago. Am I, am I remembering that right? And uh, I think, tell me if this is wrong, but that guy you were with, and I don't remember his name, but that tall guy with the blonde, the long hair, like he got, he went to fly back home, and because he'd just been to Porkfest, he was all amped up and anti-TSA, and he like refused to get a pat down. <laughs> because a bunch of libertarians want to confront him about DMCAs, so he never went back. Yeah, I don't think he would be welcome. I think he would find it very tri tricky to go there. Um, and it was so bad because, like, his... I think he must have told that his supporters the year that I went, all of them were wearing these free domain t-shirts, these identical t-shirts. And there's no way they all just randomly decided to do that. So there must have been some instruction to do that. And they were the most insufferable wet blankets you could ever imagine. Like, you would be having a conversation with somebody and they would just interrupt and be like, UPB, shut up, you don't know what you're talking about. Like, everything was just that simple. Uh, and like, they're just the most insufferable people ever, except for, well, but except for their guru, who's even more, uh, blah, blah, blah. Dan lives in New Hampshire now. That's his name. So I couldn't remember, but I, I remember meeting him. I remember, do you remember Camel? We got into, I got in a heated argument with some guy in a cowboy hat about, um, about protectionism because there was a pro protectionist and I just laid down the Bastiat on that motherfucker. Boo. If you aren't allowed to overdose on heroin, are you truly free? No. No. Oh, well, you need to be doing it while you, you know, enact pedophilia against, you know, children. Buh, 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 buh. It was both of us. Yeah, I remember. I remember. You're like married and have kids now, though, right? If Facebook is any, any indication. Yeah, UPB is so laughably bad. So true. Yes, I the the first video I did on Molyneux was right after Porkfest. And it was just, and you can find, uh, I even quoted in the video, I said, there's a moment where he said that utilitarianism has no role. And I think uh, YouTuber Nielsio found the clip because a lot of the lectures on YouTube will be recorded. And eventually uploaded. Now they're not, usually not uploaded right away. They show up sometimes months later. But there are people there who systematically record everything. And somebody found the video of Ben Powell asking him about that. And he was like, no. No role for utilitarianism. Gun in the room, gun in the room, gun in the room, gun in the room. Because that's the argument he came up with. So that's got to be the best argument and the only argument. I remember when I was down the FDR rabbit hole, in some ways I missed those days, but so glad I'm free from it. Yeah, there's something about believing, having the certitude of just believing that you're right and believing you have the answer to everything. Uh, there's just something really, that just really padding to the ego about that. And there's lots of things that do that. Religions can do that. Uh, and ideologies can do that. Communism certainly can do that. And libertarianism can do it. Plenty of people who think they know everything because they read one Rothbard quote or whatever. Uh, and... Molyneux is very good at 
cultivating that kind of mentality and attracting people who are susceptible to that. And I got to give them credit for that. It's not easy to do, right? There's lots of would-be cult leaders out there, and you know, very few of them succeed as much as he has. So, tip your hat, I guess. But geez, I feel like I was inoculated to Molyneux because I knew enough beforehand to see where he was talking bullshit. Because if you watch his videos, there's just tons of bull. I, I remember he did a video on Gandhi, and he said. Just, just as one thing, he was going through the history of India, and he said the Mughal, the Mughal Empire ruled India for seven hundred years, and I was like, no, that can't be right. I know that the Mughals ruled for like two hundred and eighty years, something like that. I went and checked. Sure enough, yeah, they ruled India for two hundred eighty years. So I just made a comment. I was like, look, this doesn't mean that every argument in this is wrong or that everything is bullshit, but like to say that they ruled for seven hundred years is just factually, blatantly, demonstrably false. And then that makes me wonder about every other fact that he cited that I wasn't aware might have been wrong. And then his supporters came and defended him, said, what's your purpose for saying this? Who are you working for? What's your motivation? You know, why are you so biased? I'm like, look, I'm just pointing out he said something that's blatantly wrong. There's no dispute that it's wrong. And people would still be like, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you for pointing that out? God, fucking people. Uh... But then Molyneux says, ethics don't matter in a lifeboat scenario. He literally throws his argument away. His first pushback. And as Jim Jesus pointed out, the fact that he's a hypocrite when it comes to, you know, when he says you can ignore Marx because Marx was a hypocrite. And his his claiming that Marx is a hypocrite is kind of flimsy because it's saying he lived off of a capitalist, therefore he was a capitalist. I don't know if that necessarily makes him a hypocrite, especially since he thought that there were stages to history and that they were in the capitalist stage. Uh, but then... Yeah, he uses intellectual property, which we can find tons of videos of him saying there's no such thing, and that's a gun in the room, and blah, blah, blah. So by his reasoning, then he is a hypocrite, and we can just ignore everything. So good on Jim Jesus, good argument. A couple of voluntarists I know here in Los and love him. Look, he's made tremendous stuff. He's made, like, some of the stuff he's made is poetic. And beautiful and spot on. And he's done a lot. Look, there's tons of arguments he's made that are good arguments. And he's been very erudite and articulate much of the time. But he's also a messianic maniac. And he has a huge God complex. And he's petty and vain. And he wants to portray himself as this God king of philosophy. And he's not anywhere near that. And that's no slight against him. Nobody is that. And I would not say you're unintelligent because you're not the greatest philosopher in 6,000 years, but he cannot deign to submit to that level. And he cra it's funny, too, because he clearly craves academic recognition and, and accolades, and you know he wants that so bad, but he doesn't have any of that. So he gets accolades from people who don't know anything, who don't know anything about philosophy. You're like, you're the greatest philosopher ever, and they're like, name two other philosophers. And they're like, uh, Rand and Aristotle. Yeah, good job. <laughs> yes. Well, it depends on the problem. Depends on the problem. Some problems you can. Doesn't he tell people to cut off all, cut off, cut all the status out of their lives, including parents? Very cultish. I don't know if he says that now because he's a Trump supporter now. So, you know, that's out the window, maybe. He did a video where he was trying to address that. I think so. I think the other thing is like after the, the Andrew Zimmerman case, and he started to get this broader appeal to just the alt right or right wing people instead of just libertarians, and he sort of crossed into this populist phase and not just the niche libertarianism. And so it's weird because he's become more popular and had a broader base. And at the same time that that happened, he alienated libertarians both because of the DMCA claims and also because of like the bitching about small donations where he would berate people for giving him small donations. <laughs> so he, like, he, he, like, he, he angered a lot of libertarians in that. And so he kind of has shifted. But the problem is his, his claim to fame, he has this huge backlogs of material where he's this anarcho-capitalist libertarian. And his whole UPB and practical anarchy and all these other things is this radical niche libertarianism. And now... I think he's conflicted because there's just a bigger audience. And the thing is he craves spotlight and he craves, he craves having that audience. And so now he, you know, if he wants to be just become an immigration warrior because that's a bigger pulpit, then he'll do it even though it goes against, I mean, I remember my favorite Molyneux video he did 
it was about immigration and how it doesn't hurt the economy and all this stuff. And the last line that he said in the video was, for all of those who want to build a wall, you should remember that walls can keep people in. And then he turned the video off. And I was like, wonderful. That's beautiful. That's a great argument. That's poetic. And now he's completely 180 on that. So, But he made a video where he was like, I haven't, like, the truth is the truth, and if, if the light of truth changes, then I change with it. So, like, kind of like everything he says is true. I don't know. Totally weird. Yeah. Just pondering, does he think of himself as an ANCAP Ubermatch? Yeah, if, uh, Freedom and Liberated has done a good job of cataloging some of this stuff, but he he written, he had stuff published, like, in New Rockwell way back and like, I don't know, 2003, 2004, where he was saying, you know, we need some kind of libertarian philosopher king that's renowned around the whole world that everybody, not just libertarians, that everybody respects and who can just be like, here's the answer to everything. Here's a, a coherent, what he would call, um, what would it be, rational, rational philosophy and secular ethics or whatever. He, you know, he said religion failed. You know, we have, used to have religion. And you had to have morality because of God. And so he created secular ethics, you know, through UPB. But he said, we need to have this renowned person. And then everyone in the world will be like, oh, this person knows everything. And they have uh, proclaimed libertarianism. And so we'll all be libertarians now. And, like, that's just fanciful on so many levels. But also just the ego necessary. Because he's clearly talking about himself. Or at least hoping to be that himself. And I remember when he first came out with UPB and he did videos. He's like, I've done it. I've cracked the code. I've... I've I've created this system of morality in the in the downfall of religion and like people just tore it to pieces ex omniverse like like other libertarians there's this oh just read the David Gordon review of it it's scathing it's un, like oh so awful and he just ripped to pieces and you know here here it's like oh even the other libertarians like don't like it by and large uh, so it's kind of a total flop. And yet here he's thinking this is going to be his ticket to like libertarian mortality. Not libertarian. Like he has said, true sheeps had these up, you know, like I'm the greatest philosopher in 6,000 years. I'm the greatest speaker in 250 years. You're lucky if somebody, libertarians would go back 2,500 years if it wasn't for me. Jesus Christ, man. Like, and the thing is, it's not as, as Jared points out here, not only was best at restating arguments other people have made, he does a good job at that except for accepting to give them credit yeah that's a that's a good skill to have like he's in he's a very intelligent guy and that is there is nothing wrong with with doing that and yet i think that he has an he doesn't he wants to be the creator of ideas in his eye there's a hierarchy and the people who make ideas are higher than the people who repeat ideas no matter how eloquently that they do that and, you know there's different types of intelligences and that was another one of the things that i first noticed about him because um even before I saw him at Porkfest, uh, he saw uh, someone called in and was debating anarchy. And and Molyneux says, well, I came up with this thing called DROs, dispute revolu uh, resolution organizations, and they will solve disputes. When two people you know, uh, commit a crime or whatever, th these DROs will figure it out. And I knew immediately, okay, Hans Hermann Hoppe talks about the exact same com uh, uh, concept, except he calls them insurance companies. You know, and he was talking about them like in the early 90s, in like the 1880s and 90s in the private production of defense. So then I concluded, well, Molyneux either knows that and he is, you know, just taking those ideas and pawning them off as his own, in which case that's dishonest and petty, or he doesn't know that and he's actually pretty ignorant about this philosophy that he claims to be the champion of. Either way, nuts to him. And I do think so, like this emphasis on the gun in the room argument. That's not the best argument, but that's an argument that he can attribute to himself. Now, I don't even think that's true, but he would like, I made up this argument. I made this, the against me, the against me. So any argument that he thinks that he came up with himself is the best argument. Indeed, the only argument. So there's nothing wrong with restating other people's ideas. You know, every once in a while, I think I have an original idea. I remember once I had a, 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 I thought I had an original idea about how the marginal utility of defense and whatever, and then I read about it in, in one of Rothbard's books. And I was like, oh, fuck, I thought I had that idea, and it's gone. So, but does it mean I think I'm an idiot? No, it just means that, you know, I didn't come up with a new idea. Oh, boo-hoo. He says people, he said, if people wear Nikes after you explain how bad 
Kaepernick is cut them <laughs> cut them the hell out of your life. Okay, why is Kaepernick even the, what the fuck? So that's just such culture warrior bullshit. Vegan on anti-black bullshit. Okay. I'm willing to cut him some slack. He did have brain cancer. Ha! Ah, funny. Just assumed his shift to authoritarianism stemmed from that. Hey, maybe. Or dealing with the Canadian healthcare system. On a scale of 1 to 10, how good was my live stream about Molina's response to Gordon and why... Why was it a 10? And why was it a 10? You said it was a 10. I don't think I saw it, Jim, to be honest. Or is that the one where you talked about uh, disproving UPB? I see why he likes Trump. Trump has all the best words, and he has the best ideas. Sure. Who can argue with that? But, uh, he calls them what? DRO, Dispute Resolution uh, Organizations. But they're just insurance companies. Oh, sorry, Jared. Yeah, I'm not. I, I can only read so fast. Isn't private arbitration already a thing? Yes, it is, because public arbitration is so goddamn ineffective and so costly and slow. And also, there are just sometimes there's ju jurisdictions that aren't covered. There's a lot of international agreement things that are not covered by international law, and so you have to have private arbitration. So it's already a thing. It's an it's one of those things where people like. The, the main argument against anarcho-capitalism will be to say, like, that's just impossible without the state. And then that's empirically false because we have it happening without the state or where states aren't operating. So then the actual argument would be, which one is better? You know, they both can do it, so which one is more optimal? And that's a much more tricky debate because you have to start doing a cost-benefit analysis of states versus anarchies, and that's very tricky. So people rely on the much simpler but much more demonstrably false argument that only states can do it and non-states simply can't, and that's just not right for just about everything. But uh, do, do. yeah, I mean the. I, th I think people have known this just for a long time that for the vast majority of potential conflicts, these are, these would be anticipated, and people would just include them in contracts. Hey, if there's a dispute, if you have a dispute with your landlord, that's something that could be predicted, and you would just put it in there. Hey, third party arbitration, whatever. Uh, it's only going to be a margin of the cases that you're not going to have a prearranged thing, and that's when you you find a, a private arbiter. Hmm. Him defending the cops in the Eric Garner cases, as well as the woman that fled from the cops in D.C. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we started calling Mexicans a different species to me. I was like, nope, I'm sorry. Say what you will about cultural differences and, you know, not liking democracy. Sure, I get all that, but whatever. I was reading Rothbard again one day after going through his first few. Yeah, I mean, look, he's restating things, and that's fine. That's what I do on my channel. I don't come up with original stuff, and I'm not going to berate somebody who does that, and he does it very well, but then he wants to pretend like it's him. And that's just unnecessarily, and it's just, he's relying on the ignorance of his of his followers, though. So he, he's hoping that most of them have never read the Tannen Hills or Hans Hermann Hoppe or Rothbard, and so they won't know that it's from them. And tr true enough, most of those people have never read anything. They've never read other, it's, it's crazy when you have somebody who'll be like, Stefan Mullen is the greatest philosopher forever, and you're like, what other philosophy book have you read? And the answer is zero. So it's like, well, fuck, how can you even know that? You can't even name any other philosophers. How can you know he's just so... Ugh. But but you, that that's a psychological thing, because then you're like, I'm a follower of the greatest philosopher ever, so I have the greatest philosophy ever. That's what that's saying. Not the... the it's just... No, it's terrible. Uh, companies will actually enter private arbitration with governments. Pretty crazy to think about that. Ryan Falk pointed out the latter on, and Molyneux said he never read Rothbard. So I don't know. So, like he says that, like it's um, like that makes him smarter somehow. I never read Rothbard. I'm an ignoramus. That's just. I mean, I get it if you're just if you're just a normal person and you're not about spreading ideas. You don't have a YouTube channel with thousands of people. Then I don't. You know, you don't have an obligation to be well read. But if your whole thing is that you're the fucking genius of the world. 
and whatever, and you have not read fucking any Murray Rothbard, then you don't no, then retire from existence. Jesus Christ. Couldn't you learn something from him? Even if he's wrong, like Rothbard is wrong about plenty of stuff. I don't agree with Rothbard when it comes to abortion or copyright or lots of other things, right? Uh, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't read him or know. Like, how how can you... It's like you want to be... An, it's just like he wants to be this expert on philosophy who doesn't read any philosophy. Like, he, like he's, so, he's so brilliant that he can just in, intuit everything. It's just... Whatever. Okay. Sorry for turning your Porkfest stream into a Molyneux stream. Sure, but it's kind of related because that's where I first saw Molyneux. And that's the thing, is you can go there and you can meet Molyneux, you can meet David Friedman, you can meet, well, not Molyneux anymore, but, you know, that's that's one of the beauties about it. The RK breeding! Ah! He called Mexicans a different species. Yeah, he said that they were different, like, they had different reproductive rates to the extent that they were a different type. <laughs> Uh, I don't remember which one is which, but RK, RK species, is it one of the types have, they go to having just a few offspring that they then invest a lot of resources in. So humans, whales, elephants, you know, ele elephants don't have a litter of a thousand elephants. They have like one. In fact, you might argue that like all mammals are, are one. And then you have other species that have like a, a billion, you know, not a billion, but like a million eggs. And they just know, well, yeah, 99% of them are going to die, but that 1% are going to make it. Uh, and humans are are definitely the small. They invest more in their young. There's no question about that. And the, the differing birth rates between different countries, you know, they matter. There's there are distinctions to be bad. The, the the group with the highest birth rates are, are the Hutterites, and Mormons are really high up there. Jared, you should know that. I think the average number of children per couple in Utah is like 4.2, but Hutterites are double that. Um, but whatever they would, so they would be more likely in other species than. Than Mexicans, but Mormons, Mexicans, okay. Hey, what's your stance on abortion? Don't have a no opinion. It's an unknowable question. I think abortion should be mandatory unless you have a birth permit. You know, so Eric, you bring that up and you laugh, but that's actually kind of close to Hans Hermann Hoppe's position. Because if you read about what he thinks about immigration, he's like nobody can immigrate to a community. Not only not only do they need to have like get a get a landlord. But the, whoever is sponsoring them needs to like sign an affidavit and then be responsible for that person like forever. So if, if you bring an immigrant in and 10 years later they commit a crime, you're liable for that. And so basically you need the consent of everyone in a community for having even one person move in there. And I was like, okay, okay. So shouldn't we have to do that for children too? Like shouldn't you have to get the – you know, children are, you know, your children could become assholes. Your children could become delinquents. And in fact, you know, when they get into that late teens, early 20s, that's the area if they're male that they're most likely to commit crime. So, I mean, what's the difference between bringing in, you know, an adult from another country, one who we might actually have an established record and be able to say, hey, this person is 30 and they've never committed a crime. They're probably going to be okay. And your kid, well, you have no idea. So funny funny but it when you listen to hoppa talk about immigration he it's hard to see how that wouldn't also apply to children r is a lot of offspring and k is parental investment okay we need to think of some like rhyme or rhetoric to remember that so r is for hmm k is for parental investment i don't know so i want to think of a good good uh, like rhyme for that so my rhyme for the the various uh, classifications of animals uh, is king penguins cheat on fair game sometimes? K kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So we have to think about something like that for R and K. Boop, boop, boop. K is for kindness. Oh, uh, for your thousands of babies, right? Lynn confirmed for future Harvey Two Face dead. What is showing in a burner face with acid? Side note lighting in your room makes it look like half of flights in your tiny bed are working. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little weird. Um, the lighting is in such a way that I have to sit on my bed during the night. 
would birth permits be a reasonable idea if you had a perfect intelligence giving them out like an all-knowing robot that can I mean if you're if you're gonna postulate an omniscient force that just knows everything then I mean presumably you would just you wouldn't just let it do that you would just let it decide everything right there'd be if, if it literally knew everything not only would it make sense to just allow it to make every decision it wouldn't matter whether you wanted it to or not it could do whatever it wanted i mean like omniscience omniscience implies omnipotence in basically any practical sense so assuming such a thing existed there would be uh, no debate to be had uh k is for kindness Duh -duh. Birth permits mean eugenics. So do marriage licenses, to be honest. So good on Alabama for abolishing them. I actually saw the um, New Hampshire State Police were doing uh, sobriety checks on the highway by Porkfest last week. So I, I, we're wondering if that's some kind of presage for things to come. Uh, because what, what ends up happening is there's a couple of hotels just down the street from the campground where a lot of people stay. Uh, in fact, I've heard other people relate stories that you'll just see David Friedman like walking down the highway. Um, but it's presumed that like many of those people will be carrying drugs of one sort or another and that the police kind of leave it alone. It's, it's kind of like not worth the trouble. You don't need a marriage license to make babies. No, that's true. Would it be morally reasonable to oppose? I, I, see again, that's such a weird situation. If you have omniscience, it's just kind of questionable why you, if, like, w what role morality has in that situation. But I also think it's like, it, I don't know if I would have any way of verifying that something even was omniscient. So like, this, this would be something that like, it seems like it's not logically possible. It could be omniscient, but we wouldn't know. David Friedman wandering New Hampshire giving economic advice. Yeah, so I think he, you know, people associate him with Chicago and California, but actually um, um, Milton Friedman did a lot of research at Dartmouth, uh, kind of like independent study there. And I know that like he kind of had his family up in Hanover. Uh, so Dartmouth is a beautiful little town with lots of cute guys to hook up with, but it's, he kind of grew up there. And I think their family even had like a house, a cabin on a lake. So David Friedman has been going to New Hampshire for a long time. So I think like, this pork fest stuff might be surrogacy for that to a little bit. But he seems to really like going. I don't think he would come so frequently if he didn't enjoy it. B -b 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 Wandering down the side of the road, yep. Farting. You know, I've heard stories of people talking to him and he just farts really loud. You know, if that's your thing. Like Kane from Kung Fu, only not as cool. Their house is called Capitaf or Capital. I did not read his autobiography. I was hoping his son would come. I know he doesn't do sea studying anymore, but that would he would have interesting stuff to say. Like there's a list. I mean, obviously the the coolest person to come to Porkfest would be Ron Paul. Uh, he would be such a rock star there. Um, so that would be like the biggest coup. Peter Schiff goes a lot. Peter Schiff, Peter Schiff's brother. Saw Peter Schiff's brother playing a ukulele one of the years I was there uh, with somebody else. Uh, yeah, it's just a crazy, crazy place. Capital, because the book Capital and Freedom paid for it. Did they say where? Is that on Lake Winnipesaukee? Did he say what lake it's on? There's a whole, the whole central part of New Hampshire is called the Lakes Region. There's a series of these large, uh, inveterated lakes with lots of little bays and peninsulas on them. With super high property taxes. Like in Laconia. I don't know if he goes there when he comes back, but it seems like he goes to Parkfest like every year. Uh, well, it's close enough. You know, the states out here are a lot smaller. 
So something can be in Vermont and still be 20 minutes away from New Hampshire. Like I, I, I'm 25 minutes away from Massachusetts, where I am right now. So it's it's kind of different if you're not from New England. If you're from out west or the Midwest, and you're used to states taking five, six hours to leave, or ten hours to drive across, it's different to be in a state where like you go an hour in every direction and you're out of the state. So like where I live in Manchester, Massachusetts is twenty minutes away, Vermont's an hour away, Maine's an hour away, slightly less, uh, Connecticut's an hour and a half, two hours away. It's just kind of a Canada's two and a half hours away. In the West, where we have some freedom, uh, aren't you in Washington State, where they like just ban guns, and you're ruled by the Seattle fucking liberals, Microsoft? Am I not right? Am, don't am I not right about that? I mean, it's the it's the left coast after all. You might have a you might have an argument like in Idaho or Montana. But even like Colorado, you know, Denver is this big, in Seattle, literal socialism. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. <laughs> you should escape. What do you think of modern monetary theory? So all I know about modern monetary theory is I listen to... Uh, Bob Murphy's podcast on it and it just sounds like it's it's just ridiculous. It's just the people who think that they can print money to solve everything. So Denver is super liberal. Denver is like the new world order capital you know, of the world. There's a lot of creepy stuff too if you go to the airport. I think Patrick is somewhat oh hey Christopher. Good to see you on. I think Patrick is somewhat back in Seaside scene. He's been doing some podcasts recently. It'd be great to get him at see him at Porkfest. I think it would be great to see him at Porkfest also. Um, I think Matt Pritchard said that he met him at a bar and he was saying that he was into Seaside, but he was starting to do these free these free market cities in Central America. But it sounded like I think they were doing one in Honduras, and like the Supreme Court in Honduras said that they couldn't do it or whatever. Uh, so I guess it was Nick's on that eye, that idea. So visitors at uh, M MMT thinks the only constraints are physical. Ooh, yeah, the only constraints are physical and then like the calculation problem because then you're just start, you have these physical limits on the capacity of the society and then the state is just if they can print as much money as they want, then they could command an ever-growing share of, of the resources. And then the there's there's always mismanagement, right? A corporation mismanages stuff, but there's a limit because they can go out of business. If it's the government, they can't go out of business. And so the amount of mismanagement is like potentially enough to cause mass starvation. But that's what you get in like Soviet systems. So yeah, there's a huge limit. The, the bigger the firm is, the more potential there is for there to be waste. And the more potential there is for, the, for there to be corruption as well. And I mean corruption in the in the malicious sense, corruption like, hey, give me graft, give me bribery, but then corruption in the sense that um, people can have an ideology that's just crazy, but they sincerely try and enact. And so maybe they get the idea, for instance, uh, let's say Green New Deal people get it in their heads that wind energy is the best thing in the world. And so they just start, inv we invest a ton of resources in wind energy, when in fact wind energy might be like the 10th most you know, advantageous thing, and it's a huge waste, and it would have been better if they had done it in something else. So that wasn't something that was necessarily done for graft reasons or for, out of uh, 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 selfish corruption, but it's still a, a type of corruption that you're going to get. Uh, but, but I mean, MMT, MMT is so ridiculous that Paul Krugman's against it. I'll just say that. If, if Paul Krugman and Bob Murphy agree, then it's probably a bad idea. <laughs> B -b -b do you think Marx made any good observations? It's hard for me to say yes. If you read McCloskey, Dieter McCloskey, she definitely thinks that he did, that he was very cogent about a lot of things and he just made a couple of mistakes, but he is also apparently just a horrible asshole and has contempt for just about everybody else. So I don't know. Um, 
he it was it's difficult because he was really into this dialectical materialism and this whole Hegel, Hegelian way of writing stuff, and so the way he liked to express himself was like needlessly verbose and and imprecise and not clear. And so when you and and I apparently Engels even complained about this in Das Kapital. He was saying like the way you're writing this implies like you're going for a point, and the way you write it, you you're implying different points, and it's going to confuse the hell out of people, and it and it certainly did. And so it, it's hard for me. I guess I would have to read more of his stuff. I've read a whole bunch of what other people have said about him. Uh, Thomas Sowell's book on him is great. And there's another one called The Farewell to Marx. I think the only stuff that I've read of his was The Communist Manifesto. And I'm not even sure how much of that he wrote and how much was Engels. So I don't know. You see, I guess there's consensus he was a smart guy. And so, you know, maybe he did make some observations that were great, but he's just wrong about so much. And I mean... I'm not going to like go out of my way to try and find good things to say about somebody whose ideology killed hundreds of millions of people. So I, I, that wasn't his intent, but that's what happened. So uh, what do you think about Amazon getting so big? It seems like it's, they should be reaching the calculation problem. Uh, maybe, but it depends, you know, the, uh, it depends on the market. Uh, I definitely don't think that they're like a, this is a weird thing because now people say anything that's big is a monopoly, but they're certainly not a monopoly. Anything you can get on Amazon, you can get from a competitor of Amazon, and there's big competitors. I mean, at this point, they're competing with Walmart. So, um, yeah, it, de it depends on what type of business it is and what, what the market is and, and what the margins are, but there always is going to be one. And the thing is, as soon as you make a – the idea, you'd have to be an omniscient corporation, but eventually you're going to make an investment that proves to be a bad one and you're going to have losses. It doesn't mean you're going to go out of business, but the idea that you can keep hitting a home run every time, which I don't even think it's fair to say Amazon has done that. In fact, I think that through most of their history, they've been growing and not making a profit. But, but, but I think, I think look, they're, they're like the first internet business that really found something for you to buy routinely. They're really smart because books were like one of the few things that made sense to buy online. People had a lot of hesitancy to spend money on, on goods through the internet without inspecting them first. And they're like, well, books is something that you can be reasonably sure it's going to be okay. And then through that, we're able to develop a system of how can we how can we get people to trust buying something like a computer or or something else that's more technical and, or even food. Now there's now the point where you can get food on there. Um, and so that's great. But like by being a pioneer, they're encouraging people to compete with them in other ways so uh yeah that's an interesting question though to know when how do you calculate whether or not somebody uh, is following the calculation problem or not and i guess it's just the question of like if they're profitable assuming they're not getting subsidized which i don't think amazon's really being subsidized that much thanks eric have a good night you should definitely skip uh you should definitely go to pork fest and not uh burning man but you know that's my my two cents. Boop, boop, boop. Any thoughts on the five top five states to live in? Well, I mean, honestly, that depends on on you. I mean, if you if you love beaches and sunny days, then like it makes more sense to live in Florida than than North Dakota. Uh, but the ones I like the most cer certainly New Hampshire, uh, Wyoming, South Dakota, Utah, uh, Montana. It's three, four, five. Yeah, that's five. Indiana would be up there. Alaska, maybe. Uh, southern states. I really hate Texas, but Texas isn't that bad. Uh, Alabama, maybe now, because you don't need a marriage license. So good on them. Let's see. Maine's not bad, especially if you like white houses and kelp. Uh does anyone from the NRA or the GOA attend Porkfest? Well, I'm sure members of those organizations go. Um, they might have booths even. Uh, most of the libertarian think tanks will be there. Cato and Mises and uh, Reason will usually go. Uh, but I don't think the NRA would go. The NRA is a little bit too mainstream. GOA might. But this year, as I talked about, the, the founder of Black Guns Matter is going to be there, Maj Ture. So he is going to be there. Uh, in the past, the Appleseed Foundation has been there. So like uh, the whole gun rights thing, it's a huge open carry event. It's probably the 
it's probably the biggest like open carry event that happens every year. Um, it's not explicitly billed that way, but there's just a lot of open carrying that, that goes on. So like I said, I've seen, I've seen like 13, I, he was 14. I asked him cause there was this kid running around with an AR 15, an AR 15. And I asked him how old he was and he was, he was 14. And it was funny because he had a, a buddy with him and I was like, Oh, are you like brothers? He was, no, this is my friend. And I was like, Oh, does your, do your parents know that you went to like this anarchist, like conclave that everyone was carrying guns. He goes, no, they don't know. They just think we're going camping. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, so it, I, there's a good chance GOA, but probably not the NRA. But that's probably fine. The NRA is pretty pretty moderate, to be frank. Uh, you think Trump is right that China should respect intellectual property in American business? No. Because I don't believe in intellectual property, and the problem there is that the United States shouldn't enforce it either. Boom, problem solved. Okay, what's next? Have you heard read Integral Theory, developed by Ken Wilber? No, I haven't. Yeah, so I can't answer that question because I'm not familiar with it. And when I say not familiar, I don't think I've ever heard of it. Isn't the NRA too tied into government-facilitated weapons industry to to go to something like Porkfest? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Like the pork, uh, NRA is, I've heard interesting things. Like the NRA is mostly like an insurance company and, and that they're like their, their political arm is like a tiny fraction of what they do. And, and like, it's a really interesting organization. And, and the thing is like public perception of it is, is just, it's totally driven by like the media portrayal of them which is just totally ridiculous portrayal not just in just in how inaccurate it is and how and there's no nuance to it so but they're a very moderate gun rights group uh they've done a lot of good and yeah, like i'm happy that they exist because they have been very effective um but they compromise on a lot of things they're too pro police uh i know a lot of people who um just they cancel their memberships because of the mo um the castillo uh what was his name fernando Cast castillo who was a concealed carry holder who got shot by a cop uh, without cause. There's a video of it. It's a horrible video to watch. Uh, and they didn't say anything about it. Um, but then they got a huge upscrap after, after, after uh, um, the fucking Fab Four of uh, Stoneman Douglas High School in their um, ridiculous town hall. Uh, I think they got like 50 million in donations like the next day or some ridiculous amount like that. Somehow they got my number and they started calling me, which I've never given them any money. I was a member of GOA in, co in college, and if I was going to join an organization, it would, def it would definitely be Gun Owners of America. Gun Owners of America is a vastly better organization. Or even JPFO would be a good organization, Second Amendment Foundation. Pretty much all the gun rights groups are way more radical than the NRA, except for the NRA. The NRA is the most moderate of all the gun rights organizations, essentially. Ba -ba -ba. Ba -ba. Please, yeah. Ba -ba -ba. Do you support Andrew Yang and his idea of universal base, basic income, one thousand dollars per? No. So I like Andrew Yang. I think in the sense that I think he, you know, has ideas and he's about ideas and he wants to spread ideas and he's willing to have honest discussions. And I like that he's kind of anti-circumcision, although he backed off on that like immediately. But I think the whole UBI is wrong. Uh, I'm not persuaded by that. I think it's economic ignorance. Uh, and I know that there are arguments with AI that it's going to be different than previous incarnations of technological development, but it just doesn't sound that way to me. And I think it's, I mean, if it's true, if it's as bad as they think it is, then that a thousand dollars a month isn't going to do shit. So pretty sure the NRA isn't involved with military weapons companies. Yeah, they're not, the NRA is not a gun dealership. Uh, like if you listen to like the Brady campaign, they kind of have this conspiracy theory where they make it sound like the way it works is the NRA lobbies lobbies for pro gun laws. The pro gun laws make the gun companies rich somehow, and then the gun companies give money to the NRA. And so there's this corporate circle, and the thing they're leaving out, and they leave it out in at least. And all three steps is in all three steps. The reason that stuff happens 
is because there's tens of millions of gun owners who take their gun rights seriously. And those tens of millions of gun owners vote and tell politicians, hey, we don't like you restricting guns. They give the gun companies money because they buy their products, right? Gun stores do good business most of the time. People are willing to go and shell out thousands of dollars, hundreds of dollars, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars to gun companies because they value their products. And they are willing to join organizations like the NRA. They're willing to give money to organizations like the NRA. They're willing to go onto mailing lists. They're willing to send out letters. They're willing to call people. Now, the Breda campaign doesn't like that because then it makes the NRA look like it's a popular grassroots organization representing millions of people, which it is. They want to pretend like it's this corporation, that it's this special interest. And it's, no, it's just representing the will of like literally tens of millions of Americans. Uh, so, and you know, for every member, there's, I mean, I'm not a member. I'm one of the most pro gun people that you can ever imagine. I've never given them a penny, right? So you got to imagine how many people are there like me or, or less radical than me, but are still pro gun that are, don't do anything with the NRA. So that is their conspiracy theory to treat the, <laughs> like, yeah, that's the, they, they want to pretend like the NRA is this, just this, like. I don't know, shill for the, the gun companies and not that it represents the interests of, of a huge segment of the American population, which is the true that it does. Favorite Democratic candidates. Uh, that's definitely Tulsi Gabbard. No question about that. Uh, she's wrong about a lot, but she's right when it comes to war and empire in a very big way. She's not 100% right, but she's very close. Uh, and she's taken a heating. You know she's right when the, when the New York Times is calling her a toady of Bashar al-Assad. I was just looking at a like a diagram that the New York Times came up of the different candidates, kind of summarizing them. And for Tulsi Gabbard, it was like crazy crypto fascist, you know, friend of the horrible, horrible dictator Assad, you know. But she, they don't say like, oh, Hillary Clinton, you know, best friend of the Saudi royal family or whatever. So yes, Tulsi Gabbard, hands down, no questions. You know, I would even vote for her in the primaries if it would help her and. I'm pleased that there's uh, lots of signage for here in New Hampshire, like a lot, like for nobody else but her, which is crazy because this is hardcore Bernie country. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Can't be anti-circumcision with the Jewish establishment ingrained in American politics, huh? Well, that's true, except way too many Gentiles circumcised and way too many Gentiles are for circumcision because circumcision, the reason it's so popular as a as a ceremonial rite of passage is that it really has a strong psychological effect on people. That's your fucking penis. And that's, you know, for better or worse, that's a significant part of a man's identity. And so when you do it to somebody, it's just like any other kind of abuse that you enact on a child. They're going to want to continue that circle. Of abuse. There's a good chance anyway. So there's a ton of Gentiles. Most of the pro-circumcision people in the United States are Gentiles. They're not Jews. Uh, and the doctors who pushed circumcision initially were Gentiles. They were not Jews. The people who wrote books, I mean, there were Jewish doctors who, who favored it, but there were people who wrote books who were clearly not Jewish, who were saying this is a good idea, and they popularized it. And the military popularized it, and the military wasn't run by fucking Jews. So, yes, there's that, but there's this parallel Gentile medicalized thing that has now become a cultural thing. And so... People love to just point it at the Jews and say it's the Jews, the Jews, the Jews. And th I, th their role in this is, it was important at the beginning in the sense that that's where they drew their inspiration. And this type of circumcisions that Americans do is directly inspired by the type that the Jews did. Because the medical reasons that they that they used, you know, be able to fully retract, to prevent phimosis, that, would, that could be done. Uh, it's vastly overprescribed and that's not really a problem in the sense that they make it sound. But you could do that with a much more vi uh, limited type of circumcision that only removes the ap apocrypha, uh, what's it called? I should know this. The the, the the tiny bit of overhang that would then allow fully retraction but still keep the glands covered. But uh, no, they do the full the full on, the, the uh, uh, full Jewish ceremony type. But I think people overplay the role of the Jews in all of this. It is not, it is totally a Gentile custom at this point. Uh, ba -ba -ba. For example, yeah, goldfish. I, I don't. I've never heard of this. 
So I don't I don't really know. Uh Yeah, I wish I could tell you more, but I, I've honestly, you're the first person who's brought it up to me. So I've never really heard of it. Um, so I'll look it up and, and see what I think, but it's not something that I've, I've encountered. I thought Kellogg brought it back to American Gentiles. So, okay, it is 100% true that Harvey Kellogg was a big proponent of circumcision, but his role in this is vastly exaggerated. It's kind of this interesting factoid that people like to repeat, and it's true, but that really, look, Doctors were the reason it got popular is because doctors were telling families you should get this done, and adult men would almost never be persuaded, but they could be persuaded to do it to their infant children. But the doctors who were doing this were not were not relying on Harvey Kellogg; they were relying on other doctors who were 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 promoting this. So it is 100% true that Harvey Kellogg was a proponent of this and wrote about it. And it's true that the ideas that he had were shared by many of the doctors who were also... So they wanted to stop things like masturbation. They wanted to stop a, a made-up disease called spermaturia. They wanted. To, they thought it would help you protect you from syphilis or from gonorrhea, which is completely false. Um, right. So he shared those ideas, but he did not spread them really. He's not really responsible. There were a couple uh, late 19th century, early 20th century medical texts that just were very popular that, you know, basically recommended uh, routine male, uh, routine infant circumcision for all males for prophylactic reasons. Uh, and so it's this one of these factoids that people really believe in. And it's, it's true, but it's people really, really, really overstate this. It's similar to people saying that the Jews just did it. That's just, again, the best books on this are Robert Darby's The uh, Surgical Temptation, uh, and he did another one, I think it's called uh, The Sorcerer's Apprentice about the history of circumcision in the United States, which is an ebook. You can buy it on Amazon, though. It's worth reading. Um, but people really, really overestimate how important he was. Oh, bu -bu -bu. To be fair, sometimes it's the Jews. Yes, sometimes it is, uh, but not always. Good night, Goldfish. Thank you for watching. It's always good to hear that uh, somebody's been watching for a long time. So I'm sorry I didn't have an answer to your question, but I will try and look that up and just see if I have any thoughts. But uh, have a good night. Duh, duh, duh. I'm not going to remember those books. Well, you can watch the video again. The whole thing. It's The Surgical Temptation by Robert Darby. And also, I th the that that is called, it's called the history of circum of medicalized circumcision in the UK, but that covers the United States too. Uh, and then there's another one. I think it's called the Sorcerer's Apprentice, uh, which is about the history in the United States. Yes, the Surgical Temptation by Robert Darby. That's an excellent book. That's that I was really surprised by how good it was. Um, <laughs> To be fair, there's a lot of stuff we don't know about the United States. For instance, uh, when I saw a screening of American Circumcision, um, the author of The uh, Hidden Trauma uh, was there. And that, that's a great book, by the way. And Ron, his name is Ronald Goldman. And somebody asked about the role of the military because there's all these stories of people getting circumcised in the military. And I've actually had people comment on one of my videos. A guy commented, he was from Australia, and he said he was trying to join the Australian Navy. And during his physical, they said that because he had phimosis, because he couldn't retract his foreskin, they would not allow him to be in the Navy. Now, he didn't have a problem. He wasn't infected. He didn't have any issues. He was happy. And they said, you can't be in the Navy if you have uh, unretractable foreskin. And so he got circumcised. And the, he was com commenting on my video like a week later, freaking out about it. But so there's lots of anecdote, anecdotes like this. So somebody asked uh, Ron Goldman this question, what was the role of the military? And he says, we have found no documentation that the military ever forced circumcision on anybody. And a hand went up right away. And he goes, like, I was in the Navy. I was told on my ship, there will be no foreskin on this ship. That if you were not circumcised, you had to get circumcised. And there's a lot of stories like this. And there's a lot of stories that during World War One and World War II, 
it seems likely because the military, the 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 common medical established medical idea at the time was that that uh, circumcision would protect you from certain venereal diseases, as they called them at the time. Uh, and if they believed that, then it would make sense for them to say, "Hey, we don't want to have these." I mean, it was a big problem, right? The military didn't. They spent all this money to train a soldier. And then they get the clap or whatever, and that's a huge pain in the ass. Literally, because you get a shot in your ass when you catch the clap, for those of you who don't know. Uh, and they didn't want to do they didn't want to deal with that. So uh, they it seems logical that they'd say, look, you're all just getting cut. It's better anyway, blah, blah, blah. So there's a lot of stories along those lines, but it just apparently hasn't been documented really. And I think it would be interesting if a researcher could go and try and find anything you know along those lines but we just don't know just thinking about circumcision causes me a really unique anxiety thinking some pleasure can't be recovered even after restoration do you feel less anxiety anger after being so far restored well first of all can you clarify i'll answer that uh are you thinking about it and are you are you intact or are you cut yourself because i've had i've had, sometimes i've had guys who are intact say just the idea of getting circumcised bothered them so much one guy was telling me that when he when he reads about it he actually like instinctively covers his crotch because the idea of like taking a knife and cutting his foreskin is just so painful in his idea that he can't even imagine it um so i'm wondering what your perspective if you're coming where you're coming from on that um I don't, I think anxiety is the wrong word though. Uh, I definitely don't feel anxiety about, uh, about it. I feel anger. I feel emasculation because you think about like, well, you're a real, like a natural man, like the evolved humans. Um, okay, there we go. You've been covering your glands for two years, but only restoring for six months. That's interesting. Um, well, you, you okay? You do. I feel like when your glands are covered, you feel better. You get this. You start to feel quite normal to have your glands covered, to where that just feels more comfortable. And when they're not covered, you feel weird, which is kind of an interesting thing. That's all. Like an uncut guy would have something analogous to that. Um, no, no, it's more like a. I mean, I I had this happen very recently. Actually, I was, had had an uncut guy over. And I was uh, stimulating his frenulum. So, he, again, I wasn't, no other stimulation. I wasn't uh, stroking him, kissing him, fingering him, anything. I just licked my finger and I was slightly petting his frenulum like that. Like, just like that. And I'm mean, he's moaning, he's squirming, he's leaking pre-cum, he can barely talk. And, again, I'm practically just doing like this. And, um, you know, we finish and he's like, can I do that to you? And I was like, well, I don't have a friend, you know, so, you know, no, we can't. But he's like, well, are you sure? I was like, well, okay, we can try. And so, you know, he tries it on me, but of course there's nothing there. I mean, it's just gone. Uh, and that's not a good feeling, right? Cause I, I know, I mean, we can get, I can't tell you how many times I'll get in debates and people will tell me, well, this study from Uganda shows that. There's no difference in the sexual pleasure. These got these adult men who got circumcised. Well, yes, they wanted to get circumcised. It's the worst selection bias you can imagine. It's like the definition of selection bias. Uh, you can't tell me that there's not a difference because I've seen it, and it just makes it makes logical, complete sense. There's entire. It's not just tissue. There are specialized structures that clearly have a sexual function and purpose that are just removed that are sensitive and erogenous when they're still there. And those are gone when you're cut. And I've seen it with my own eyes plenty of times now. I don't want to sound like a slut and say how many times. Many, many, many times. So, you know, I think that that goes without saying. And it's impossible not to be like, okay, there is a... a there is an aspect of masculinity, of male identity, that they have that I don't have and that I will never have. Now, with restoration, you will get some of that back. It won't be all of it, though. 
Um, but there people have two minds on this because yes, you won't have as much back as an uncut guy was, but you won't really miss the stuff that you never felt. So from your perspective, it will just be this vast improvement potentially. So, and I've even, some people, this is speculation, right? So I don't know that this is true necessarily, but, um, uh, it, your brain is not used to feeling those things. Like when you have enough skin to do the sleeve action, um, that is just a different feeling. And that's something your brain is not used to. And it's really good. It feels really, really good. And it's very satisfying. Uh, and I think that because you don't know what you're like in terms of viscerally understand what you're missing, it's a good feeling. So no, I don't think it's anxiety, but yes, there's a lot of, yeah, there's anger and emasculation would be the ones I would say. Covering my glands was such a difference. Soon after doing it, I felt extremely uncomfortable without the cover and the sensitivity change was just tremendous. Yeah, okay, I had a very similar situation. I started covering and within two weeks, I started feeling like lots of differences. And a lot of them weren't sexual, just like in the in the showers, drafts, uh, just all kinds of stuff. But yeah, oral sex, um, topping, all those things felt a lot better after, like orders of magnitude better. So it makes a huge difference. Your head is supposed to be covered and it's supposed to be covered not just by anything, but by by your skin, by well, actually by a mucosal membrane, not even the skin. It should be covered, like the inside of your foreskin is like the inside of your lips. In fact, the foreskin is very similar to the lips. It's one of the similar, where you have this transition from external dermis to a mucosal membrane, right? It's this transition zone. It's also very sensitive like your lips. This foreskin is a lot like your 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 lips and a lot like your sphincter. So, you know, there you go. So, you know, but definitely feelings of emasculation and regret and uh, it's really frustrating and it's really, it makes you feel very jealous also because you're like, oh, they get to, and, and the other thing is like most uncut guys is just totally mundane and normal for them. So they don't really, I don't want to say they don't appreciate it, but they don't appreciate it. You know, it's just, that's normal for them, but they feel things that cut guys will never feel and never can feel. Uh, and some of them do realize that and they become really sympathetic and tactivists, but most of them don't. Uh, bah, bah, bah. So is LYG, is that short for my name? Yeah, covering your glands. And, and like for those of you, people who don't want to do restoration, I would recommend just doing gland coverage. Uh, go to get a, get a, for, uh, get a manhood. Or get a um, an artificial foreskin and just do that, or try um, O rings or whatever. If you can do uh, retain retaining, so retaining is when you uh, use the skin that you have to cover your head, which I think most people can do. Not everyone. Um, I think that retaining, you know, is is a good stand-in for restoration. Yeah, it's fine. I don't as long as I know who it, who it means. I don't like. I don't have a problem with it. I just wasn't sure who you were talking about. It makes sense because it's a long name to type, so I don't mind. Do, do, do. All right, guys, let's well, get getting kind of late. Any other questions before I hit the sack? It can be about Porkfest or anything else. Foreskin, Stefan Molyneux. Something I know about, hopefully. Are you moral intuitionists? I'd say I was heavily influenced by Humor's book on that, but I wouldn't go as so far to say that I am. Did you say you were for sure going this year? I'm as sure as I can be. I already, I've, I've already made arrangements for the room, and I've paid for my ticket. And uh, it doesn't sound like there's anything in the way of me going, so that's what's going to happen. And I recommend for any of you to consider going. It might be a little late this year, but where there's a will, there's a way, and it's definitely worth doing. Uh, and if not this year, it's some other time. And if you go, say hi. 
just I'm not going to know who you are based on your name. So you're going to have to like, you know, introduce yourself in a way that's intelligible. So, all right. Well, that's going to be it. Uh, I'm going to say good night and, uh, well, good night.